Uh, and it didn't synchronize, so I even lost those changes. Uh, there is an assignment due uh, this evening uh, for this class, uh, one second before midnight. Please make sure you get that in on time. Um, late assignments uh, aren't accepted uh, for this class, and it goes away uh, once that deadline uh, is reached. Question? Yeah, so what the, the Wi-Fi uh, um, Well, obviously, I'll have to do something with sliding. Through, but you also shouldn't be waiting until the day before or the day after uh, to get the homework uh, done. So I'll figure that out. If it's not on by noon, then I'll just make it out. You know, well, the Wi-Fi you can't do the announcement. Um, so we'll figure it out. If it's not out by if it's not back on by noon, uh, then I'll um, make it one more day. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I've been trying to see if I can write this. You're a, a long way. Yes, so which is why I said if it's still down by noon, then I'll um, change the rate. Any other questions? Thank you for your question. No more questions? All right, so I guess it was a surprise to me too uh, that the power is out, um, which means you can't uh, access this board and you can't access a lot of things. Uh, so we're going to do it kind of old school. And unfortunately, we won't have annotations, but I do uh, still have the ability to screencast. Um, did anyone see the screencast link? Yeah? Okay. All right. And apparently, I learned the hard way um, uh, that it's really tricky if you post clips of music, even though there's something called fair uh, use rights. Uh, and I have an ongoing dispute with Sony Music Entertainment uh, for a clip from uh, Stochastic Metal Plus. One of my other classes. So, nonetheless, uh, why don't we continue on uh, where we left off? And so, we we're talking about uh, computer system architecture, and we talked about so called multiprocessor uh, systems. Now, of course, uh, these multiprocessor systems have more than one processor, and there are different uh, ways of thinking about that, different incarnations of that, and I'm going to have to keep looking backwards. Uh, at the slide because I don't have anything in front of me, but um, these are immensely useful uh, because if you have more processors uh, on your system uh, or in your system, you have the ability to do more quote unquote work, right? And doing more work can mean uh, many different things. And as we illustrated there, it means you can take a large problem. So here we have that uh, strip, uh, say so we're sorting numbers or finding the maximum uh, number in a list. So there's our list. And with that, you chop that problem up into pieces. In this example, uh, you're chopping in, uh, this list up into two pieces, so dividing it in half. Um, and then you're sending each half to one of uh, uh, a, each of a different uh, processor. And then that processor would be finding the maximum in its respective half. Then you collect those two answers, and then you find whichever is the biggest uh, from each of those local maxima. And so, as you can imagine, uh, if, if the list is very uh, large and you're breaking it up into pieces, uh, it takes less time uh, for each processor uh, to work on uh, a fractional piece than it does for one processor to work on the entire piece. Now, uh, when you're dealing with uh, millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of records, uh, you can realize uh, quite uh, a reduction in time to do something um, by so-called parallelizing the problem. And so one of the advantages uh, that multiprocessor systems afford you is the ability to so-called parallelize the problem and therefore make it much, much faster. Another uh, reason uh, or way in which these multiprocessors are used um, are so-called economies of scale. What does that mean? Suppose, you know, you're someone like Amazon and certainly, you know, everyone in Delaware, Delaware is a fairly small state population-wise, doesn't yet have a million people. But let's say everyone in Delaware wants to buy stuff off of Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. Now certainly, um, a million people trying to connect to a web server uh, to do some online shopping is more than a typical uh, machine instance can handle. And so, if you have a multiprocessor uh, system, and I'm using this term more generally, uh, and we'll talk about different incarnations of it. But if you have a multiprocessor system, you can now um, farm out or 
hand out that workload, the requests for part of your online catalog uh, on your servers to different instances of the servers. So you might do something like, you know, everyone in Northern North County, Newcastle County, are going to go on this group of servers. Everyone in the Central <coughs> County, Kent County, are, their requests are going to go on that group of servers, and so forth. The Sussex County, the Southern County, they're going to go on yet another group of servers. Uh, you might have one set of servers for each state or each region of the country or what have you. So this economy of scale refers to the fact that if you can increase the number of processors in this multi-processor system, you can take advantage of the fact that you can service or do more things for more people at the same time. And now, if you were sort of the engineer or the network engineer, systems engineer, or application engineer uh, working uh, in this environment, it's up to you how you so-called partition your workload, right? How are you gonna decide what requests go where? And certainly in that domain, you characterize uh, your request. It could be based on geography. It could be based on a whole bunch of other things that decide what workloads or requests uh, or requests for uh, resources are going to go on which uh, particular CPU instance. And so the increased reliabilities is yet another uh, way of these multiprocessor systems are beneficial. If you have a critical application, let's say you know, you're interacting with an ATM machine or you're making an online transaction, uh, or maybe you're doing robotics. Oh boy. I didn't even touch anything. Yep, power's out. This is gonna be one of those. Yep, nothing. <laughs> I wonder if it went out. No, the lights are on outside. So. Is, it, is it back on? Oh, there we go. Okay, that's weird. Maybe it's in some weird power saver mode. But it should, when it's live, maintain the picture. All right, thank you. Um, so increased reliability. So let's say you have an important application, right? Uh, like robotic surgery. And you know, there's a surgeon in one city over high-speed communication line with some VR goggles and operating joysticks. And there's a robotic uh, arm uh, at an operating table operating on a patient. Well, should some processor fail? at the robot in a surgical uh, suite. You don't want that thing to stop in the middle of surgery, right? And so what you might do is say, okay, well, one CPU is going to perform uh, the interaction with the robot to get to move and read its sensors and so forth, and the other CPU is just gonna sit there waiting in the wings. And the other CPU or CPUs, their entire purpose is to take over if the primary should fail. Right? Uh, so this idea of fault tolerance through redundancy can increase your reliability. Moreover, if you're dealing with something like your Amazon.com uh, data center, um, you uh, uh, fail or degrade gracefully. So in a typical single CPU system, once you get a certain number of connections, it fails. It will no longer allow any more connections. But if you have a large group of CPUs, a multiprocessor system, it takes a lot more to load them, and what ends up happening, as you reach the upper limits of the entire population of CPUs, the requests start getting slower and slower and slower, instead of request happens and all of a sudden nothing, right? Uh, so you get so-called uh, more graceful uh, degradation. Okay, any questions about this? Make sense? All right, and so there are two major flavors as we had left off with uh, last time. There's asymmetric and symmetric multiprocessing. With asymmetric, as the name might imply, meaning that there are differences. Asymmetric multiprocessing means that each of your processors has different capabilities. So some might have specialized hardware to compute certain things. Uh, some might be uh, really good with encryption and decryption uh, and so forth. And with the asymmetric, you have this group or uh, ensemble, if you will, of uh, specialists. And it's up to the operating system to decide uh, what task needs what specialist and to farm those tasks out to the right CPU. With symmetric mostly processing, it means all of the CPU instances uh, have the same capability, so everyone can do everything, and it's a matter of still scheduling. Uh, but the two types are important for certain domains, uh, the symmetric and asymmetric, uh, and I just want to make you aware, it's also in the book, uh, that these uh, exist. Okay. So you might wonder, where do these chips live? And this isn't the most recent version of the slide. It had some other stuff, but because of the network, it didn't synchronize. Well, um, a chip resides on a platter called a wafer. 
and that wafer uh, implements uh, the nanoscale, um, well, it's approaching nanoscale, um, the, uh, but it's nanometer right now, maybe five or seven nanometer. Uh, nano is one times 10 to the minus uh, uh, micro six, minus nine uh, meters, right? So it's really, really small, the transistors that form the basic logic gates uh, on these chips. And so they take these chips, they laser cut them, and each one of these little squares uh, is a processor, right? It's pretty small. It's about the size, maybe, of an uh, average person's uh, fingernail, right? So they're very, very small. Uh, this is a, a wafer, right? And you can see uh, those individual chips. They're these uh, rectangular uh, shapes here on this wafer. Uh, and this wafer is essentially uh, silicon, right? Beach sand, if you will. Uh, and it's been doped or coated with various chemicals to change the conductive properties, all right? That's why it's called a semiconductor. There are two different extremes. There's an insulator. Electricity doesn't pass, or current doesn't pass through an insulator. Uh, there's a conductor. Um, the current passes very easily through a conductor. They're usually metal. And then there's semiconductor, meaning that it's in between. You can make it function like an insulator or function like a conductor based on how you charge it up and charge it down, right? And so in doing so, you can form logic gates and put those things together and form a computer. So this is a wafer, and the individual chips are these rectangles, and they laser cut them, and then they mount them in a frame, and uh, they wire it in, seal the plastic, and you get the chip that you see uh, on the board of a typical CPU. So let's continue on, and we're going to look at what a symmetric multiprocessing system might look like. Now in this case, this is multiprocessor. Multiprocessor is different from so-called multi-core, right? You're all probably used to, or you've heard the term multi-core, right? They're related, but they're absolutely not the same. Now, in a multiprocessor system, we have multiple processors. So here, we have uh, three CPUs, CPU 0, CPU 1, and CPU 2. Now, of course, each CPU has all the usual parts uh, that a CPU would have, and I would draw something now. Uh, it has the floating point unit, or FPU, it has the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. It has the register file that we talked about before, uh, that uh, very fast, uh, very small working space of uh, temporary storage on, this, on the CPU, on the same chip. And then we have a little bit of cache, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but in this case specifically, it's instruction cache and data cache, right? So it can pull in uh, some parts of the program onto the chip instead of always having to read it from main memory all the time. Uh, and you'll notice here, each of these CPUs is connected to this substrate, a bus. It's sometimes a very highly specialized uh, substrate for communication, separate from the bus, but most of the time, it's the system bus. And also connected or hanging off the system bus uh, is our main memory. So we have three individual processors, chips, right? And these things are connected um, uh, by uh, to, to each other uh, through the bus. And also connected to the bus is main memory and other components like the I.O. controllers, things like your disk drive, mouse, keyboard, uh, etc. Any questions about this? Make sense? Sorry. So this is a multi-core uh, design, right? Now this isn't the only picture out there. I think this is a tiny bit different from the book, um, but it was pulled from an older version of the book. Now, with multi-core, one of the things you'll notice here, let's contrast it with the previous figure. Each one of these gray boxes is a different chip, and they're connected through a bus. Here, you'll notice this outer blue box here, that represents a single chip, right? So, bless you. On this single chip, you have two so-called cores. And you might be asking yourself, well, what is a core? A core represents the CPU's ability to execute instructions. And in order to execute instructions, you need to have a register file, and you need to have a program counter. And let's recall what the program counter is. A program counter, or PC, is a specialized register uh, on the CPU, and its entire purpose is to store a memory location where the CPU will go to fetch the next uh, instruction in your program. So if you have a program that says, you know, the first step of the program is to print hello, and the second uh, step of the program 
is to add uh, A and B. Well, when you're executing that hello statement, the program counter will have the memory location or address, as it's called, uh, for that next instruction to add A and B. Right? Because the CPU always has to know where is it going to go next in order to get the next instruction uh, that it's going to execute. Okay? So here, you could consider a core as being an execution unit. Right? You can execute a sequence of instructions. And therefore, each core has a floating point unit, arithmetic logic unit, and that's not depicted here, but it also has a register file. Uh, they each have a program counter, and then they have a little bit of cache to pull in uh, some of those instructions uh, instead of reading them one at a time from system RAM. So you'll notice here, you have the bus connection outside of, okay, <laughs> it's like the air raid, uh, <laughs> Never mind. Um, if you know someone who is World War II generation, that sound is uh, is a sound for like you know, you know, run, hide under your desk because <laughs> something's happening. But all right, anyways. So you notice here that this chip has connections to the bus, right? This blue box, and also hanging off that bus uh, is our main memory. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this figure is you have two pathways to main memory. Right? And that's often the case with dual core systems. You have more than one physical circuit um, that will get data from main memory onto each core and off of each core. Now, this particular setup, you'll often hear termed as dual ported RAM. Right? If you have dual ported RAM, it means there are two pathways to get data onto your RAM and off of your RAM. And of course, if your RAM has more than one pathway, that means that more than one core or more than one processor can get data on and off of uh, memory at the same time, right? Um, now, this doesn't um, get past the fact that you are always limited by the bandwidth of the bus, right? So let's say if your bus can only handle um, one data at one gigahertz rate, right? Uh, and core zero wants to transfer data over the bus at one gigahertz, and at the same time, Core one wants to transfer data over the bus uh, from memory at that same one gigahertz rate. You've used up all your bandwidth with one processor. So while you can have dual ported RAM, you certainly have to respect uh, the bus bandwidth because that's the limiting factor for any transfer of data <coughs> to and from main memory, regardless of whether or not there are two pathways to do that. Any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. So Let's take a look at another type of multiprocessor system, right? Clustered systems. And in this particular case, our multiple processors are in different physical boxes. So you have different whole computers, right? And you know, so each computer will have its CPU, it'll have its I.O. controllers, uh, it'll have its main memory, and it's in a box. And typically, these things are high density, and you'll have many of them mounted in a spectral enclosure that looks like an unwind. Right? It's uh, called a rack uh, mounted enclosure. And so the idea behind clustered systems is the same as multiprocessor systems, only instead of individual uh, processors, you now have multiple, instead of multiple processors, you have multiple machines. And these machines now use a network uh, in order to coordinate and communicate with one another and work on problems. Okay. So how do you use storage on these things? Typically, there's something called a storage area network or SAN. And a storage area network is nothing more than a disk with a disk controller, but it also, that controller includes the ability to send and receive across the network. So you have a lot of these SAN instances uh, scattered around the network, and you have a lot of these machines scattered across the network communicating, and you can use them uh, to provide all sorts of uh, collaborative types of applications. Now, certainly you can use this to chop problems up, large problems. Each one works on a piece of it, and then the result is consolidated from all of the solutions, uh, partial solutions, to those pieces uh, of the problem. There's something called asymmetric clustering. Now, in asymmetric uh, clustering, just like asymmetric uh, multiprocessing, each of those uh, server instances uh, serves a different purpose. And this is where I draw something again. Um, so, in something like e-commerce, I remember early in my career when I just graduated, uh, one of the places I worked was an e-commerce startup. And 
um, you had different machines, and these machines did things um, that uh, was very special, so it's asymmetric. So what happens? When you contact a website, you bring up a catalog, right? And that catalog has pictures, and it also has prices and description. So all of that content has to be stored somewhere, and it's stored in a way to make it easily updatable. So you have one server instance, and its only job is to return back pictures of items in a catalog. Then you have another instance. You might have uh, you type a search query for some item you're looking for. So you have some machine that's going to handle the indexing uh, and the actual query associated with all the items in the catalog. And that would be handled by yet a different machine, right? Uh, so you have a catalog machine, you have a search query and indexing machine. So then you go ahead and you click on something and you type in your information and there's something that assesses the sales tax. You have so-called payment silos associated with sales tax. And then uh, you're gonna have to contact the post office and transfer money to their account uh, in exchange for them delivering the item uh, to your home or your destination for that product. So there's another machine uh, that contacts the US post office and handles that part of the transaction. So already, we haven't even finished doing the tracking and the fulfillment and all that stuff, and we've involved a number of different machines just for you to click on something and hit buy, right? In that case, that's an example of asymmetric clustering. You have a bunch of machines, and there are groups of these machines that are singularly purposed with a particular function. And the reason why people do that is because if you make it simple, you can make it really, really fast, right? tune it for uh, specifically being fast for that purpose. So then there's, in contrast to that symmetric clustering, as the name would imply, all the machines do everything. Now, of course, which one is better? It really depends on your application. It really depends. There's no one right or wrong it's to justify why you have a particular architecture. And in the case of clustered applications, one of the first questions you ask is where you're going to place your computation. All those different subtasks that collectively uh, define the pipeline uh, for the end-to-end -end application that we have in mind, whether it's purchasing, whether it's um, doing uh, the Google, Google Street View drive-through, uh, or doing all sorts of stuff. Plastic. Oh, thank you. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, I think when the slide's just static, it thinks it's uh, idle, which is weird because. Uh, I have the HDMI connection up. Thank you. OK, so asymmetric cluster. Now, some clusters are specifically for high performance computing. Uh, and those are things like national labs with renewable energy research and you know, um, um, gas and oil exploration, uh, meteorology, where you're simulating uh, the tracks, the probabilistic uh, track that a hurricane can take. You need a lot of highly specialized processors. Um, that are very tightly connected, and in that case, they're not going to use the traditional network. They have other sorts of things, like fiber optic network, called fiber channel, uh, marionette, and other specialized things. Um, we also, when you have these clustered machines, um, these machines, let's say, you know, you only have five uh, items in an inventory, right? And you know, six people come along, and they want to purchase one of those items, but you only have five in inventory. One machine would have the database containing uh, your inventory, and that inventory would be linked to fulfillment. So the moment someone takes something off a shelf and scans it and says, I'm taking it off the shelf, that inventory database would decrement in real time. So if you have that inventory database with real time levels of inventory, and you have five or six rather different people that want to purchase it, well, one of them is going to be out of luck, right? And so you have that shared resource, the inventory database. And you want to make sure that when multiple people at the same time want to use that resource, you're ordering them in some fashion. So if six people come along and they want to buy one of those five items, that means five of them are going to be happy and one of them is going to be out of luck. And it doesn't matter how you order them, but you can only allow one at a time to access that inventory database incorrectly through his or her purchase. Okay? And how you do that is with locking. And the same way you have locking, which we'll talk about uh, for a single system and a single operating system, you have so-called distributed lock managers that handle that in clustered systems. And the whole purpose of this distributed lock manager 
is to ensure that when you have multiple entities across the network trying to access something, to ensure that they're ordered in some fashion, and only one at a time can change the state of that resource, okay? So that inventory must go from five to four to three to two to one to zero. And you do that by ordering the requests uh, that uh, will change the state of that or value of that resource. All right, any questions about this? So this is a general schematic, it's from the book, um, a schematic for a clustered system. So here you have a storage area network that might be a single disk, it could be multiple disk instances uh, that synchronize with one another through a high speed communication link separate from the regular network. And then you have a bunch of compute instances, uh, these are entire machines, and they're connected to one another through a network, right? Now, it is the case in most modern clustered systems, they're gonna be in a data center somewhere and they're gonna be sitting in a rack-mounted enclosure. And I can um, show a picture of all this stuff uh, next time. But hopefully the uh, network is up on useful. That would be bad. All right, so let's go further. And operating systems have changed quite dramatically um, over the last 40, 50 years. And in the beginning, computers weren't that common, right? It might be hard for all of you to believe, because you're all fairly young, but at one point, and this is before my time, uh, at one point, uh, the idea of having a machine all to yourself was unheard, right? Um, a computer uh, that would fit on your wrist uh, would occupy something like two or three times the size of this room, right? It's very primitive, like a calculator um, by today's standards in terms of computing. And because these things were so big and so expensive, and there were so few of them, people shared the usage of these. And so each uh, desk would have a type of terminal, and that terminal was just a screen and a keyboard, and it connected through a glorified phone wire uh, to this large computer that was very expensive. And so the first task at hand in operating systems history uh, and development uh, was to try to come up with ways uh, so that multiple people could gain access to and share uh, this single machine uh, in an efficient manner. And so one of those ways was so-called multi-programming or batch-based systems. So you start out, you write your program, you submit it to the machine, right, from your terminal. Now, in the early, early days, people tell me that you didn't even have a screen, like a TV screen or a monitor. You had uh, what's called a telecast, right? You would input a command, it would type on a piece of paper the command you did, and then you hit enter, and then the spool would turn, the piece of paper would advance, and then it would type, literally type, um, the output from the computer. And so with that, you would write your program, you input it to the machine, and then you hit submit. And then sometime later, it would execute the program, and you'd get the result, right? And that was called batch-based uh, system. And so this batch-based system was a way of sharing this uh, big expensive machine, of which there were very few, maybe there were a few dozen in the entire country, at least in the US at the time. Uh, and how it did it, it would take all the programs, it would store them in different parts of memory, and then it would execute them. So the first program stored in memory would get executed, then the second one, then the third one. But if a program needed to do stuff like pause for input, or engage in I.O., um, it would switch to the next one because I.O. is a fairly slow operation. And while that I.O. is happening, it would go into other stuff and then come back to that program eventually. So a single user didn't get a CPU. That was unheard of. Now, of course, it's advanced to the point where not only does the average person have a computer, you have these mobile devices that you can bring anywhere. When I was in your position in undergrad, um, you had to go to the computer room. Right? And you know, we had computer rooms here just like five, six years ago, and now everyone has their own machine. Right? Um, now going forward, of course, everyone's gonna have their own mobile device, and once 5G uh, wireless communication is more pervasive, you're not even gonna have to worry about getting a signal. Well, theoretically, right? The power is up. Anyways, so we had one job, which was the name for a program, they got selected and it was executed. And if it needed to pause for I.O. action, the, pro, uh, the CPU, this machine, would switch to another program. So then, 
this evolved over time into something called time sharing. Uh, this idea of batch was the first sort of generation of the way these resources, the operating system shared these machine resources among a, a bunch of different programs. And in this case, a program was something a single user sitting in a terminal uh, wanted to do. So then, this evolved into multi uh, to time sharing. And the time sharing said, okay, well, if we have these multiple programs running at the same time, we want the responsiveness to be much faster so that each person working in a terminal has the illusion that you have the machine all to yourself. Uh, with the batch mode, if your program uh, paused for I.O., your experience at your terminal uh, would be that the thing would stop, and it would just hang there, and then it would return once they got back to your program and continue running. And they thought, gosh, well, people like things that look responsive, that look like they have exclusive use of a resource, even though it's being shared. So what this Time sharing did uh, so called multitasking. This multitasking was to divide up the processor's time into standard units and now to give each program some standard amount of time. It could be two milliseconds, and then the next person would get two milliseconds for his or her program, and the next person would get two milliseconds, and then it would go back in the first program and get two milliseconds, you get two milliseconds, and so forth. And this time sharing was an improvement on batch type uh, sharing, uh, where it was more responsive, because if everyone's getting a standard fractional proportion of the CPU's time, to you, it looks like it's more responsive, instead of your program pausing when it goes to execute the next job. Any <coughs> question about this? So you might be asking, gosh, well, if you're sharing this, what happens to memory? Now, all of those programs certainly can be fit in memory, right, in time sharing because it now meant you can have more users using your system. Now, the solution they developed is says, okay, well, we need some way to manage this memory resource. And how they manage it is instead of loading your entire program into memory, they load pieces of your program into memory. And whenever it needs to access another piece of your program, it would now unload that piece that is working on its memory and load a new piece, the next piece of your program into memory. And this was facilitated uh, through a special uh, part of disk that we'll learn about when we talk about virtual memory. It's called the backing store, right? Um, if you ever, on your system, run a lot of software, it'll run, but you'll notice it'll be doggedly slow, and your hard drive will be working really hard. And the reason for that is that if you run enough programs at the same time, you're gonna overwhelm your memory storage and your operating system is going to be shuttling on and off of that special part of disk, parts of your program, in order to fit everything in RAM, okay? Now, since disk is slower than RAM, um, you're gonna see that slowdown, because in order to use different pieces of your program, it's gonna hit your disk and load that block of data uh, across the bus, okay? All right, and so you have several jobs, and this um, multitasking improvement over batch uh, type sharing of the system uh, was the portioning out of standard units of time to each program and the shuttling on and off of RAM of parts of your program to execute. Um, any questions about this? And again, I don't have my stylus because I need wireless to connect. Um, otherwise, I would draw figures for this stuff uh, to ground some of that down. Okay, so any, no questions? Any questions? Make sense? Okay. So, this is what the layout uh, in memory of a multi-program system uh, might look like. You have your operating system sitting at the bottom. Now, this is an unfortunate picture. This is also from the book. But usually when they draw this, it's flipped uh, upside down, where the operating system is at the bottom. That's typically how it's drawn. I don't know why they did it this way in the book, but I included this picture uh, just to mirror what's in the text. And so you have the operating system in the lower parts of memory, and then you have uh, in the higher parts of memory, so you notice here on the left-hand edge, you have memory location zero, and this is uh, memory location 512 meg, where one meg is, uh, is two to the 20 power, okay? Uh, so we have job one through job four, and each uh, job or program occupies some portion of RAM, right? That was the setup in the traditional batch uh, type, uh, uh, type uh, sharing of your, your machine. Okay, 
And so the operating system, if there is no demand on your operating system, like there's no program that needs to run, there's no I.O. device uh, that needs uh, services, um, the operating system just sits there idle. It doesn't do anything. It's a so-called reactive program. And it's purely interrupt driven. The moment someone needs uh, services from it, it interrupts what it's doing, and what it's doing is nothing if there are no demands on it, and then it attends to uh, whatever that request for services was, right? So the first thing that happens when you turn on the power in your machine, uh, the firmware runs and it does the marching ones test and tests out all of the circuits and makes sure that everything is functioning as it should, and then it loads the <coughs> operating system. It loads the operating system, the operating system is loaded off a disk and it's located uh, in a certain region of disk, the, the bootstrap loader it's called. And then it's loaded to memory and the operating system is handed to the processor and it runs. So the first thing the operating system does is just listens for interrupt. If there's no interrupt, it just sits there idly and just waits, doing nothing, kind of twirling its thumbs, so to speak. So then maybe you type something at the keyboard. That keyboard through the I.O. controller sends an interrupt that says, ah, you need to transfer from the keyboard controller buffer to uh, someplace in RAM, whatever that keystroke was. And an encoding for that character is copied across the bus and into RAM, right? You type something again. All of a sudden, when I say type to then you hit a single key. But you can imagine how quickly this process happens, and then you hit enter. And then that string that is stored is now sent to the operating system, and that results in it loading some program and running it, okay? You double click on an icon, right? That double click from the mouse, uh, that's an event that uh, interrupts uh, the operating system, and it takes uh, the buffer associated with the controller attached to that mouse, and it copies that mouse double click. That means something to the operating system, and it looks at where on the screen, what position of the mouse you had. It's associated with a particular program. It has that associated with the icon information, and it goes ahead and runs that program, loads it off disk, and runs it uh, associated with some application. So outside of responding to interrupt, that's really just what an operating system does. It does nothing else. It's interrupt driven. Right? Whenever there's a demand placed on it, the operating system does something. Okay. So it's a responsive system, and there are two types of interrupts. There are hardware interrupts that's associated with uh, peripherals, devices, things that use I.O., um, and there are software interrupts. And these software interrupts are used for protection. So if one program sitting in memory, so let's say you had uh, job three, and job three was writing a value at some memory location, and it tried to write a value in a memory location that it does not occupy, right? Now, without that protection, basically you have a virus, right? You're changing uh, some value in someone else's program. Now, of course, there's still some ways you can, can do this. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this class. But what the operating system does, it says, hey, wait a minute, job three. That memory location that you're trying to write a value to, that is a piece of uh, real estate, if you will, uh, that you don't own when it comes to memory. That causes a so-called trap, a, so oh, a software-based interrupt. A software based. Oh, man. It's coming back. Okay. Um, that causes uh, a trap, which is a software based interrupt. And what the operating system will do, it says, hmm, who is the offending program? The offending program, job three, was the one that tried to write in the location it does not own. So it takes job three and it kills it, it stops it. Right? So that's a protection mechanism. Another uh, type of trap. Uh, or software-based interrupt is if an illegal instruction occurs, if you divide by zero. Now, of course, you know, mathematically, you learn dividing by zero is infinity, uh, but in real terms, there's no such thing as infinity on a computer. Uh, if you only have a 64-bit number, uh, the concept of infinity is really just the maximum value that you can represent in 64 bits, right? Which is not anywhere close to infinity. Infinity is more of a logical construct. So if you divide by zero, uh, this software intro will occur uh, to let the operating system know that you perform an illegal operation. And most operating systems uh, will kill off the process, the offending process that they have. Some of them will recover gracefully, but many will kill off the process. Okay, another type of intro used is used for process scheduling. 
this idea of time sharing, where each program is given a standard amount of time, like one or two milliseconds to run, how that's implemented is through interrupts. And so the operating system doesn't just say, okay, you're Microsoft Word, I'm gonna let you have the processor promise me to run for two milliseconds. It doesn't do it that way. It says Microsoft Word, you can now run on the processor, I'll load you onto the processor, but I'm gonna set a timer for two milliseconds. When that two milliseconds expires, an interrupt is gonna be thrown to force you off of that processor, right? And so uh, these traps or software interrupts are used as sort of checks and balances <coughs> to ensure that no process will hog uh, the processor 100% of the time. Is that fail safe? Absolutely not, because you've probably seen some programs uh, that will crash your system, right? Uh, but that's the mechanism in place uh, for most modern operating systems. Um, and they use these software interrupts or traps, as they're called, for all sorts of other purposes. So there are two types of interrupts. There's a hardware interrupt and there's a software interrupt. And the hardware interrupt uh, is uh, signaled uh, using actual silicon. There's a line, a circuit, or uh, a signal line called the interrupt line, right? So that will physically happen. But a software interrupt is a logical construct that implemented in software by the operating system. Okay, uh, any questions? That makes sense? So what's the time? It's 10:15. Um, so we're here until 10:45. Uh, okay. So when an operating system runs, right? There's a dichotomy. There's a uh, two-type system here, and this is called a mode of operation. There's so-called uh, user mode, and there's kernel mode. And this is related to these traps, these illegal, uh, the signaling of illegal things that programs can do by the operating system. And what these modes are used for is to build so-called privileged operation, right? So if you want to move something out of memory and store it temporarily to disk, right, uh, pieces of programs, that's a privileged operation. That's pretty serious. You don't want Microsoft Word to move your browser off of the, uh, out, out of memory, right? That's only something that operating system can do. And so this so-called mode of operation is in privileged or, or kernel mode um, if it's something that can impact all the programs running. Um, there's something called user mode, uh, which is uh, a set of operations when you're in user mode are things like computing whatever it is that your program might want to compute. So what happens when a program needs to do something like read or write a file, right? That can affect other things. So what the kernel, the operating system does, it says, okay, well, I'm gonna make available to you uh, a number of routines or functions uh, through an API. All an API is, is a set of functions or a library of functions, such that when you call them, I will do them on your behalf by temporarily switching to this privileged mode of operation. And then once I am done doing that on your behalf, a so-called system call, I will return back control to you with the data resulting from that privileged operation. Uh, and then you can run uh, in your uh, user mode uh, and keep going. And so here, this is controlled by an actual bit in a register. And that bit is called a mode bit. And that's used to know whether an operation is privileged or not. So if you are a program that's running, and you try to do something that only the operating system should be doing, the first thing that's going to happen is this mode bit is going to be checked. And if that mode bit is set to one, meaning that this is a privileged operation and you don't have the privilege to do that, it's going to stop you from doing that. Okay? And so this is a protection mechanism in place because it's really important that you have multiple programs uh, loaded in memory that one program's activity doesn't damage uh, the activity of another program. So while uh, it is a benefit to have multiple programs in memory um, with the illusion that they're executing at the same time by sharing fractional use of the processor, it also comes at a cost. And that cost is protecting them from one another so that they don't step all over each other. They don't overwrite one another. Uh, they don't hog the processor time uh, that the other should be uh, using and so forth. And so the mode bit is one way of protecting the actions that any program can execute to see, do you have the privileges uh, to do this? Okay. And so there are hybrids or different modes. 
um, more, I say, maybe eight years ago, uh, virtualization, maybe not even eight, more like 10 uh, years ago, virtualization uh, started getting really, really popular. And so with virtualization, you're running an operating system within an operating system. We'll talk about that um, in a few slides. And when you have uh, this virtualization, well, that operating system running inside another operating system, it needs to have privileges, right? Because it needs to do things, interact with the disk, interact with the network part, things that are privileged, uh, high, potentially high damage operation, right? And so they often have hybrids of this, these multi-mode types of um, uh, systems where its entire purpose is to give these virtualized environments these privileges temporarily so they can do operating systems types of things, privileged stuff. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah? No questions? All right. So I think I might end today a little early after the next slide or two uh, because not having use of the stylus is really kind of hampering, um, you know, because words aren't very interesting. You need pictures to ground them. So I'm going to end with this um, transition from user mode to kernel mode. And when you're in kernel mode, you can execute just about any operation uh, available uh, in the system. And so potentially any uh, program that can operate in kernel mode can do anything. So if you could gain kernel uh, mode privileges in a program, um, you can see what other people are working on. You can read what they're sending across the network. You can scrape memory when they're storing stuff and read what's in memory. Uh, you can intercept what they're sending to the network I.O. controller and rewrite it with something else. Uh, you could take their program and take it off the memory, take it out of memory and, and put it on disk. You can uh, have them run one of your functions instead of running their own function. That's very easy to do. And so this idea of transitioning from user mode to kernel mode, it has flaws. Anytime you see these security patches because there's a vulnerability, uh, it's because somebody figured out a way to circumvent this uh, to cause some other program to execute their own code instead of the code for that program, right? Uh, so that's why it's really important to update these security patches. But nonetheless, you have your user process up above, the gray box, and you have the blue box, the operating system kernel. And then you have this mode bit, and when the mode bit is, in this case, uh, set to zero, it means you're <coughs> executing in privilege mode or a kernel mode, right? I'm using the word privilege and kernel as synonyms. Privilege and kernel mode uh, means the same thing. So in this particular case, when the mode bit is zero, it says that you're operating in privilege mode, and when the mode bit is one, it means you're in user mode. Now, depending on the system, it might be you know opposite. One means privilege mode, zero means user mode. But you just look up in your system uh, programming guide and just find out what it is, right? So here we have a user process that's executing something. And let's say you know you want to write a file to this, right? Let's say you're um, you know mastering video or music or what have you, and then you're done. You want to say, okay, write this file to this. So at this juncture, uh, you have all the data uh, in uh, RAM and your memory manager is managing the shuffling of pieces of this to that special place, temporary storage place on disk, and back and forth to RAM, and you call file save. So when you call file save, um, that initiates a so-called system call, because you, your music program, you're not allowed to directly write to disk. The operating system does it on your behalf uh, through the system call um, file write. Now, you execute that file write, that's a privileged operation, uh, and that causes a trap, a software interrupt. Now, when that trap occurs, the operating system says, aha, well, the mode bit is one, and you're not allowed to execute file writes. You're not allowed to touch the disk yourself. I'll do it for you. So it says, you are trying to write. Give me that buffer full of information you want to write. That's the data of your music file or your movie file. And it goes ahead, sets the mode bit to zero, saying that this is privileged. And then the kernel, through the system call, writes that uh, data to disk. So now the system call is executed. It gets that buffer um, of information, bless you, and it writes it to disk. And now it's done writing. 
So the next thing it does, it says, okay, well, who called me? Well, it was the music program that called me and gave me a buffer full of information to find it right. So let me return control, i.e. the program counter, is loaded with the address of the next instruction in the music program, and it jumps to running the uh, music program again, our user process. Now when it makes this switch back to the user program, the operating system sets the mode bit to one, right? And so by setting that mode bit back to one, the operating system is saying the privileged operation is done, now we're going back to user mode, and the next time that program tries to execute something uh, that's privileged, it's gonna try again, right? And so in this way, all of those potentially dangerous critical operations, these privileged operations, are performed on behalf of these user programs by uh, the operating system. Any questions about this? That makes sense? Okay, um, so let's end a little early, end now, and we'll pick back up. Hopefully um, the network will be back up, and if by um, noon the network is back up, you can assume uh, that I will delay uh, another 24 hours the assignment. Right? So just make that assumption. If it's not up um, by noon, then you know, um, I can access Blackboard from home because it's not a campus thing, and I'll just change the due date to a day later. So try on noon. If it, does, if it doesn't work, then you can just make that assumption. Um, the other practical part, I don't know what's going to happen in the dorms because when you cycle off the power like this, I don't know if it's an entire campus or just the academic building. Um, the dorms might be out, so please let me know if the dorms are out. They are, they they are, are out. out. Okay. They are out. Because to bring up all that um, network infrastructure, it takes time, and I have no idea how long it's going to take them to do. I mean, there are times last year when a whole weekend they didn't do it. So we'll figure something. It won't be. Uh, it won't be a surprise. Yeah. All right. So I'll see you all on uh, Tuesday. And um, yeah, see you Tuesday. You have access to Slack. I, I'll certainly post something on Slack. Okay.